I have a question here that I've been handed. If there are any more, I'll, I'll pick those up as well. Apologize. I would like to apologize for acting as the black hat, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to ask some of these questions. Let's start with a question from before, from Mr. Romero. with about, about gases. Are gases controlled? I'm sure there are many different interpretations. Aren't th what about the, sol the solid remains from this process? Are they controlled as well? From the process, there's a difference between the slag, which is not a hazardous waste, that goes into the landfill, and then there's fly ash, which are made inert, and they go into a, a safe landfill. A lot of studies are being conducted on order to recover metal from this fly ash. This is an important step forward. Another question, what's the difference between the volume of reject for conventional preject and the reject from incineration? When we talk about the reject fraction, we're talking about what has not been recovered or recycled. This is rejection and this is that's what goes for incineration. It's a treatment for the waste that's incinerated instead of put into the landfill. What would be incineration reject? It would be the solid compounds because they, they won't burn. But it's not because it's incineration rejection, it doesn't burn. Okay, I ask the questions you ask. What I'd like to add there is the reject fraction from a TM, a tri, uh, mechanical biological treatment plant is about 50%. So 50% of what goes in will go into the landfill unless we treat it afterwards. But with incineration, modern incinerations with energy recovery of uh, secondary waste, the slag is very, very small, is about four, between 20 and 27 percent. And we can treat these slags very simply because they're not classified as hazardous. Therefore, we can recover something from this. And this will leave the fly ash that we heard about. And this is where research is being done to see if we can do about with this fly ash. And as efficiency is improving that we can recycle the ones when you get the first um, time through the incinerator so this has been reduced a lot so the incinerator is unbeatable if we want to move towards zero waste because 97 percent in volume in weight i can't remember which it it's recovered and it disappears with energy recovery it's from Obviously, a energy recovery plant is far more valuable, but as the Austrian speaker said, it costs about 1,000 tons per nominal ton or so. If you're talking about 200,000 tons, multiplied by 1,000 is 200 million euros. But for a, a mechanical biological plant, will cost about 36 million compared with 200 million. But the performance of the, of the other plant is fantastic. It leaves practically nothing. The 36 million plant is much cheaper, but the, you need to do a lot more processing afterwards. I'll leave it there. So, uh, more questions? So, from how many tons a year can we keep an incinerator working and make good use of electricity? So, is there a kind of measurement here? Obviously, quantities are quite difficult to assess because they're bigger and smaller incinerators in Spain. Uh, there's a huge difference between the capacity of each incinerator plant to keep one running depends on the calorific energy. If the calorific value is very low, uh, then we're not going to have fuel for combustion. So to be able to keep it running and obtain energy, obviously we need to look at the cal calorific values. And in Spain, I think we have 200 kilocalories per kilo, something along those lines. I'm not an incineration expert, but uh, I think that the smallest ones are in Melilla and Girona in Spain. About 50,000 tons a year is what they're processing. Uh, 740. And that perhaps we should be doing this in the case of the other 
plants. So there's a scale between uh, 100 so 1,000 tons, and then maximum 400,000 tons. Some it's like a scale like that. So uh, right now, there, like I guess there's a range from 40,000 to 400,000 tons a year. That's our range in Europe. We have more than 550 uh, energy recovery plants. And this uh, compares to 400 in the past. So we are now improving technology, energy recovery, and energy recovery is on, uh, on uh, following an upward trend. So in Europe, there is more energy recovery than the plants, than there is uh, mechanical, biological treatment. Zero waste has shown to promote maximization of incineration. Wouldn't zero waste would be the correct, more correct concept here in the Canary Islands? Well, I think it's up to the Canary Islanders to come in on this. Uh, so see if we've got any Canary Islanders here. I'm a Canary Islander, but the concept of zero waste is the ideal the best waste is the waste that's not generated that's why i was talking about minimization which also has objectives but very often we ignore these or we don't hit them and to reach zero waste we have to reduce waste to a minimum obviously but it doesn't really uh, exist we're always going to generate some sort of waste we've seen many different presentations today things that have to, how we can change this waste into a resource and keep it as close to its point of origin as possible. I think it's a utopia, quite honestly, although it has to be the objective. Other question. What is an alternative for biostabilized material? So what can we do with it? Obviously, there will be developments here. Biostabilized material is something that we have has perhaps been stigmatized by European regulations. There's been a lobby for quality compost, and this has perhaps stymied the biostabilization approach. But biostabilized material. Mm, is produced in large amounts and the plants in which this is produced they have a controlled system so that we can close off the uh, emission cycle as we heard from our colleague we mm, are exhausting the carbon cycle they're not going to be any methane emissions so therefore they have the correct approach, they've studied it fully. There are not any uh, taxes that citizens have to pay. We have fermentation processes that work better. Uh, taxes that have been paid. Uh, plants of 36, that cost 36 million to produce biostabilization. There's only about a third here is the figure. We're talking about investments in these mechanical biological treatment plants, and then we have the of 30 tons, only 10% is biostabilized. We have admin, public administration, public uh, coffers putting money towards biostabilization of materials. And so we had this whole setup, and then suddenly they slammed the door shut on it. So, um, what are we going to do? Obviously, we're running out of time. So, we need to be able to look at correct alternatives. If we look at Poland, for example, uh, which is a specific case I'm aware of, here, biostabilization is uh, it's applied through a mix. They burn it and they uh, produce a mix which they send to uh, tile factories or cement factories. Uh, the energy value is very low for biostabilization, but there is an outlet for this. In Spain, uh, the cement industry has basically caps collapsed until it recovers. Perhaps we cannot. Uh, meet their demands with biostabilization, but this perhaps could be a potential use. It's not real. I mean, something else I've out here. Yesterday, in Mark's presentation, he showed a lot of analysis of 
analysis of bio waste plants or selective collections and non um, bio waste plants where sooner or later will will stop being a compost and will be a, an a stabilized material if you look at that presentation again you will see that most of the analysis fell within the range of the metals which is the main concern obviously you're not going to get the quality that you get of a selected composting material but it's not that bad and work has been done in order to recover that because what is really sad is that after all this work that to end up in the landfill because it has a mineral component that we maybe we could recovery what we have to do is we're waiting for regulations for the use of this biostabilized material because the law came out in 2011 but we still don't know what we can do with this material it's not as good as the other compost obviously but i mean it's not as bad as people paint it so it doesn't bring too much pollutants that's why we use clean sports and sorting of our waste which would damage the material and all of this will bring it within uh, acceptable ranges for metal content obviously not as good as uh, selective organic matter compost but finally for those of you who have explained everything to us, it would appear that in Europe the train, the trend is towards incineration. And you also talk about the emissions of other kinds of gases. Are these comparable with regard to the amount or the damage they can do in with incineration? The forens and the dioxins that Professor Del Val talked about. This incineration seems to be the trend, or is this the trend because there's no other way of eliminating these this waste in any other way? Now, landfill is the last option, and if so, what is the penultimate option? Well, energy recovery. Now, we heard from Professor Laval about the crisis, the incinerator in Madrid. I had never heard about it personally. But um, energy recovery facilities, are the, the latest that have been built uh, over the last 10 years, let's say, now they have, they're so delicate in their treatment that they have commitments that they are going to work alongside the administration at all times. In, but there's one in Vienna next to the cathedral. There's a plaque in the central square. And... This shows us that the transmitters of pollutants, the incinerator, the, the pollutants that are being released by the incinerator are not going to actually pass through the center of the city. In fact, there are indicators, flashing indicators in the central square that sh show us this. So therefore, we take on the cost of building these plants and then we need to be able to display to the people live exactly what's being emitted at any given time. Mm, mm, okay, I will talk about Madrid because I was personally involved and I'm well aware of the issues at stake. So we had a trial period in Madrid and I was contracted by Madrid to do the environment, environmental assessment Everything ran smoothly and perfectly. We complied with legislation, which was difficult to do. We had to design the organization. Um, there was a legal issue that I'm not necessarily going to talk about, but I was here. I was involved. We did an assessment of additional dioxins along three lines. We did a monthly analysis. And this was done in the laboratory in Barcelona because that was the only laboratory in Spain and this was monitored by the council, which controlled dioxins. Now, in the region, we wanted to have displayed to us all the relevant information. I don't know what happened after this, but we wanted to have constant display in Madrid. We asked Sebrona to take the sample so that we could then analyze it. This sample gave us a result of, instead of 0.1 or 0.009, which was the results from Professor Roberta's laboratory. 
that the figures were 0.13, 0.13. That's not a thousand times 0 0.1, 0.13, 0.15. So there's a slight difference. So what did we do? We sent these uh, samples again to France for the sampling to be done once again. Cost was 3,000 euros a week. And the results were exactly the same. Um, now, I think the director of the incineration plant at that time is actually here. So what did they decide to do? They decided to close the plant. They closed it for three months until it could then be refired. So there was a tiny increase, and that's the consequences. And that is basically what the situation was. And that's the end of it. Oh. Sorry. Totalmente. Sorry, I completely disagree with what you just said. We can go to the court and Don Emilio Valeriano, and, uh, who was the uh, technical advisor, and the report that they published in the court in Madrid was quite shocking. In fact, I personally went to incinerator. And 13, 14, 15 tests were done by or commissioned by the community of Madrid. And I think about 11 of these, the level is over 0 0.1. And 0 0.13 is more because mathematicians and statisticians also consider that 0 0.13 is more than 0 0.1 from a mathematical point of view. And one single analysis was positive and this led to the complaint and this gave us a figure of 1480 times the accepted level of 0 0.1 that's 1 1.8 nanograms 1.48 nanograms so therefore we have international legislation on toxicity and these are the results that were given to us by professor Rivera's laboratory at that time so if you have other information, other test results, then I want to look at what happened at this time. The community of Madrid asked this company to reduce mercury and other pollutants. I cannot allow this to happen because I have worked for 40 years on revealing the truth, on quality, on maximum accountability of public bodies. Ciprona is the administrator here, and I cannot allow things like this to be said. And what's more, we only spoke about carbon. But we had this first report on dioxins of furanes and the presence of chlorine the incinerator plant had advanced Japanese technology at that time. But after the first report on dioxins, then we have the second chamber. And in this, uh, I think temperature is 1,800 degrees uh, for three or seconds or so. And here the, we're told that the dioxins of furans are destroyed and then they reform themselves after they leave the flu. And that is at this stage that we need to look at closer. And this is what happened in the generator in Madrid using Japanese technology because there was an injection of active carbon which brought down the uh, they used charcoal at this time and in fact the assessment didn't look precisely at how they used charcoal and the report that we got from Soprano when I visited with the civil guard I went to the factory and we talked to the uh, civil guard, we looked at the technical reports, we told them exactly what we wanted to go and look at in the plant so that we could be more effective in our visit to the plant. And the Soprona report, after the second visit to the plant, and it's kind of like a, one of these films when we see the, the police go to someone who's starting up his car and then we see in the previous flashback they didn't have a car in the first place. So what we see is something dodgy and we went we looked at this flu and we had six to eight hours of uh, air running through this flu and we looked at our targets and figures 
and we wanted to know exactly what do you do when we have this ejection of charcoal? What do you do? You strike it three or four times on the outside. Now, this absorbs the dioxins and furans. E, this is, and this is an active process and absorption of dioxin and furans. So, this is Sebrona, and this is what happened in the community in Madrid. And those are the facts, because I was there. You put in th I think we each had a different situation from a technological point of view. The technologies are completely different to what you understand as adsorption is not adsorption. But I don't want to argue about it. You're saying there's no difference between adsorption and absorption. Yes, obviously there is. You said it's only adsorbed in the pores on the surface. We, no, I'm going to leave it there. I'm not going to get into it. It's not worth getting into this. We're not going to get into technical discussions of this. I, it's half past. I'd like to thank you for sticking to the times allocated to you. Thank you very much. Una cosa nada más. One point of housekeeping. The organisers have just reminded me that we have an hour to lunch until 2.30, which is when the session will start again. Thank you very much.